the story starts with an interesting rumor. It's about a man in this world that even the most dangerous mercenaries and armed groups on the planet are afraid of whenever they see him. From the story, we can tell that this dreaded figure isn't one to be messed with. His name is Peter, and he's as dangerous as they come. However, the surprising thing about this killer is that he's an elderly man in his 60s. For many years, Peter was notorious for his ability to kill anyone he fought. But age finally caught up with him, and it looks like things would have been better for him if he had just died years ago. Unfortunately for him, he's now being hunted down by thousands of dangerous bounty hunters, and he has also lost all of the assets he acquired over the years. The fact that he's constantly being chased around is starting to threaten his loyalty to the organization he works for, even though he's basically a legend among them. The scene shifts, and we see Peter standing over a sea of men he killed. There's only one guy left, and he recognizes the man standing before him as the legendary Peter. Even though Peter is wearing a funny mascot head, it doesn't make him any less terrifying to the man. The bloody man admits that he can't understand how Peter is still alive, even when he's being hunted and tracked down by hundreds of thousands of killers. He's baffled that the assassin keeps managing to evade all the people who want to kill him and keeps staying off their radar. Peter just walks towards the man calmly. The man knows he is probably going to be killed, and our hero tells him that the reason they would never catch him, even though thousands of them seek him out, is that the Peter they're looking for is no longer who he used to be. Just then, he takes off the mascot mask, and the man is shocked when he sees the face that gets revealed. The man can't believe his eyes, and even thinks that what he's seeing is impossible. But Peter just casually points his gun at the man while smoking a cigarette, and it doesn't take too much guessing to know what happens next. The scene shifts to three months earlier and we see Peter at his bookstore. He receives a call from someone, advising him to stop ignoring the calls and go in for a hospital visit. The person on the other end then reminds Peter that he will die in less than three months. Despite all of this, it doesn't seem like Peter's mind is going to change. We see him gathering his mountain of pills, and afterward, he proceeds to arrange the books in the store. Peter isn't afraid of death, especially since the very word is the name of his profession. He thinks about how he gave the last 50 years of his life to the organization, and admits that he doesn't regret a single thing in his life. He looks at one of the books that teach how to take a portrait photo, and realizes that he's never taken a picture of himself before. That makes the old man look in a mirror while carrying a pile of books, and he sees how much he has aged. A while later, a schoolgirl walks into the store looking to buy some middle school textbooks. When Peter hears her voice, he quickly switches from his dull and miserable mood to a more vibrant customer-friendly persona. He welcomes her into the store and even cracks a joke. The girl asks if he sells used textbooks, and Peter explains that the store has books from the 1960s to 2020, including books from different countries. He asks her which one she would like, and suggests she get the latest one. The girl explains that she's getting the book for her younger sibling, and Peter surmises that she's probably a student at the nearby high school. He notices that her name tag is green in color, so he deduces that she's a senior, which the girl confirms. The girl is impressed by how sharp Peter is, and asks how he knows so much. He just replies calmly, saying that he knows everything about everyone in the neighborhood. In some cases, that would be a pretty creepy response, but the girl doesn't see it that way. Suddenly, Peter brings out a pack of brand new textbooks which shocks the girl. She immediately explains that she only has a thousand one, and points out that she can't afford all of these brand new books. Old Peter gives her a smile and tells her she can have them because he no longer needs them. The girl tries to refuse, so the old man rips off the plastic on the books so they're no longer brand new. She tells him that he doesn't need to do that for her, but he assures her that it's okay. Peter reveals that he knows how much she adores her younger sibling, just by the look in her eyes. He then tells her that she should be good to them while she still has the chance, and this takes the girl off guard. Peter just tells her that she will regret it if she doesn't. He then proceeds to sort out some other books, and the girl accidentally calls him Grandpa while trying to get his attention, so he tells her she should just call him Mr. Curious to know more about the man, the girl asks him if he has ever regretted anything before. Peter pauses for a moment, and tells her that people's regrets tend to increase as they grow older. Suddenly, our hero starts recalling a time when he had to leave his daughter so that she could stay alive. As he thinks back to the painful memory, he tells the girl that even though we all have regrets, we can never do anything to change the past. After this, the old man tells the girl that she should go back home and take care of her younger sibling, rather than doing something she would regret later on. Just then, we see that the girl is about to stab Peter in the back. But you see, he already knew that she had been sent here to kill him. He tells her that she should just turn back, and promises not to kill her if she does. Hearing this, the girl is shocked and wonders how he knows what she came for. Peter reveals that he has memorized the faces of every single student at the high school she claims to attend. At this point, the girl realizes that she's been outsmarted. But if that were me, I'd honestly just get creeped the fuck out. Anyway, Peter then makes her feel even more stupid when he points out that the knife she carried with her smells of blood, a scent that he has been exposed to for many years of his life. 
He mocks her for attempting to hide the smell with cheap perfume. Even though she can no longer sneak up on him, the girl decides to go ahead and attack him because she's already come so far. She takes the knife and attempts to stab him, but suddenly starts to feel afraid that she will be the one who ends up dead. In the end, the girl decides not to fight the old man. Peter tells her she can still have the books, because he knows that the things she said about her younger sibling are real. Judging by how the girl speaks, Peter confirms that she's also from the same organization as him, and the girl realizes that she blew her cover when she used honorifics by accident. Suddenly, two other men crash into the store through the roof and begin shooting at them, so Peter pushes the girl out of the way and reveals that in their organization, the assassin is to be neutralized if the mission is unsuccessful. This is when she notices that Peter got hit by one of the bullets, and it went through his stomach. The men open fire again, and Peter tries to fight back by shooting at them too. Unfortunately, one of them grabs the girl, while the other starts beating up on him. He punches the old man with ease, and wonders how such a weak man could actually be the legendary assassin. That's when another man with weird octopus tattoos on his head arrives. His codename is the Eight-Legged Man, and he is the boss's informant. He talks about how Peter has the greatest reputation in their organization, and how he's the highest-ranked agent. But yet, he's reduced to nothing now that he's sick. Lying wounded on the floor, Peter tells them to get straight to the point and tell him the reason they want to kill him. In response, the eight-legged man bluntly tells him that the boss doesn't like him. Peter seems confused to hear that, so the informant explains that there's a massive bounty of 7.6 billion won on Peter's head, which thousands of killers would be trying to win the moment he steps out of the organization. Our hero finds it funny that the bounty is the same amount of money he has in his bank account, and the informant confirms that it's indeed his money. The bounty is in fact the money that he saved up over the years while risking his life for the organization. Unfortunately, all that money would now be going to someone else, and the eight-legged man wants to be that person. With a sinister look on his face, he begs Peter to die by his hands. He then punches him in the face and the other man joins in the assault. Peter is sent flying into another room after receiving another mighty punch, and they assume that he's been knocked out already. The octopus man admits that he's disappointed the fight ended so quickly, and asks the other men to clean up the mess. He then goes to take a closer look at Peter, but the tricky old man surprises him with a flashbang and escapes through the back door. Realizing that they had been tricked, the octopus orders his men to go after Peter, who couldn't have gone far with his injury. The men go out into the rainy night to search for Peter, while the eight-legged man stays back with the girl. Meanwhile, Peter makes his way to a playground and hides behind the toys. As he lies under the rain, bloody and beaten, he thinks about how he couldn't even fight back. In that moment, the reality of his old age hits him, and he thinks back to how he didn't ever have a life for himself. He lived every day for the organization. From an early age, they had already taken him in. And while other children were learning how to read and write, he was bleeding every day, learning how to be a cold-hearted killer. While others were learning how to use Facebook and Snapchat, he was being taught how to wiretap and eavesdrop till his ears bled. Things only got worse as he grew older, and while others were going on dates and finding love, he had already become a Russian spy who was living with frostbites all the time. When other people were starting families, he was busy fighting in the middle of a terrorist group, just so he could survive. Peter gave his whole life to the organization, and almost died more times than he can even dare to count. However, things started to change when the new boss took over. The new boss felt that Peter was too old for this trade, and decided that he needed to be discarded. Still groaning in pain at the playground, Peter feels betrayed that the organization would treat him this way after he gave up everything for their sake. He never wished for wealth or honor, and yet they want to get rid of him like he's worthless. At this moment, he starts to believe that he lived a pathetic life, and decides that he can't die such a miserable death. Peter struggles and manages to get back up. He decides that he's not going to let them take his money, but when he remembers his daughter who he left behind many years ago, tears fill his eyes and he falls again. At last, the legendary Peter stays down and bleeds out on the playground as the rain pours down on him. Back at the eight-legged man's hideout, we see his two henchmen talking about how they would have won the bounty if only they didn't let Peter slip away. The second man wonders why such a massive bounty is on the old man's head anyway, and the first man explains that it's probably the least they could do to respect such a legend. The second man is only after the money and doesn't care if Peter is a legend. He wants that money so much that he gave up his kickboxing championship title just to become a bounty hunter to kill the old man himself. Holding a picture of Peter they took while they were on the roof, he promises to become successful after killing him. This is when the two men are interrupted by the voice of a man, telling them that this is the only picture in existence that shows his face. As the men turn around, they are shocked to see Peter standing in front of them. But this time, there's something very different about him. For some weird reason, Peter is now a young man, and the men even find it hard to believe that it's the same person, so they just assume that he's someone else wearing the same outfit. Peter himself admits that he doesn't know what happened, but claims that when he woke up, he was already like this. And judging by the bullet hole in his shirt, it appears that it's actually him. 
The second man still doesn't believe that it's Peter, so he tells him that he's come to the wrong place. He assumes that he's just a student and tells him that he shouldn't be there. Enraged, Peter grabs the man's arm and asks that they take him to the eight-legged man immediately. Hearing this, the men assume that the young man in front of them is also in their line of work. The second man tells him that it means they would have to kill him to reduce the competition, so he tries to punch him. However, Peter effortlessly stops his fist with his palm. The man is bewildered by his strength and wonders if it might really be the legend. He attempts to throw another punch, but Peter just crushes his knuckles with his bare hand. The first man tries to sneak up on Peter from behind, but he quickly turns around and lands several hits on him while he's in the air. The second man grabs a knife to fight, asking our hero who sent him here, but Peter just replies that the men who master cutlery weapons are third class at best. The man gets confused by this, but our hero continues the lessons by adding that the men who mastered all weapons are second class, while those who can use anything as a weapon are first class. Immediately after saying this, Peter grabs the octopus tentacles nearby and wraps them around his hands to use as a weapon. The man charges at Peter with the knife but he effortlessly uses the tentacles to disarm him before wrapping them around the man's neck. If the opponent was a girl, we would have all the pieces for some good hentai. Peter strangles the man and flings him into the big pot of spaghetti with the tentacles still tightly holding his neck. The defeated man stays down, asking the assassin about his identity. Peter picks up the picture they took of him and remembers what the eight-legged man told him would happen to him if he leaves the organization. He asks them if that's the only picture they have of him, and when he confirms that it is, he burns it while lighting a cigarette. Now, even if a thousand men are after him, they'd never find him because the old Peter that they are looking for is already dead. Elsewhere, we see the eight-legged man in his car with the girl as his hostage. He thinks about how it would soon be announced that Peter is wanted, so he wants to catch him first. The eight-legged man reveals that Peter isn't expected to live for much longer and suggests that he show some kindness to his subordinates because of his condition. Meanwhile, Peter leaves the eight-legged's hideout, and later, we see him staring at himself in a mirror while shirtless. He's perplexed by what's happening to him, and how he's suddenly transformed back into his younger self. The bullet wound that was on his waist is now gone, and even the pain he was suffering due to having cancer is gone as well. Even though he has no idea how it all happened, the only thing he knows is that he can't let himself get recognized by the numerous bounty hunters out for his head. He knows that they'll always find the traces he leaves behind, but they will never find the old Peter they're still searching for. He decides to change his clothes, and just then, he overhears two thugs talking. He approaches them and tells them to take their cigarettes outside since they're in a no-smoking area. The thugs try to intimidate him, but Peter insists that they go out. The fat one out of the two just slaps our guy, telling him that he'll let him off the hook since he's feeling good today. Pissed at the insolent fools, the assassin walks away, and the thugs think that he's afraid of them. My guy walks to the door and locks the restroom, claiming that he's going to deal with the thugs quickly. Peter walks menacingly toward the thugs again as they just stand there, feeling confident that they can take him on. He rolls up his sleeves and tells them that he's going to teach them a lesson for not respecting their elders. The fat thug gets fed up with the man, so he tries to slap him again, but Peter quickly lands a lethal right hook on the side of his torso. After he knocks out the first thug, the second one pulls out a knife and tries to intimidate the assassin, asking if he knows who he's messing with. Peter admits that he doesn't know him, but confirms that he's holding his pocket knife the wrong way. The dump thug is confused, so our hero explains that he will cut himself when he takes a swing if he holds the knife like that. Tired of this bullshit, the stupid thug swings the weapon at the assassin, only to get disarmed with ease. After that, he swiftly hits him on the neck, making him fall to the ground while holding his neck in pain. Afraid and unmatched, the thug begins to fear Peter and asks him of his identity. Peter doesn't know what illegal things the thug does for a living, but he tells him that he'll have to die if he tells him who he is. He then takes all of the guy's clothes and leaves him naked in the restroom, when he swears to do only legal things henceforth. On his way out of the place, Peter logs into his bank account and sees that all of his money has disappeared. Outside, he overhears two students talking about a scholarship, and it makes him remember the place where he grew up. He grew up in a place called the Glory Orphanage, which was operated by a religious facility. It's been 50 years since he left, and now that place has transformed into a massive cartel that spreads its influence in all corners of the political and business world. They now mask themselves as an organization called the Glory Club. It's the same organization he's been a part of for many years, and now he plans to bring it down with his own hands. Elsewhere, we see the eight-legged man going to see a man in a cold chiller where meat is kept. The smug man asks the octopus head if he came here to deal with him alone, and the hit man replies that he's already overqualified for this job. Sitting there confidently, the target responds that the people at the Glory Club are going to die sooner or later if they keep trusting in Peter, but the eight-legged man doesn't seem to be interested in talking too much, he just wants to get it over with. They talked back and forth for a bit, but before they could see any action, the eight-legged man was surrounded by men holding knives. 
it turns out that this place is the base of operations for the Wagner mercenaries, which holds the title of the best private military company in the entire West. Despite being surrounded by dangerous killers, the eight-legged man is unfazed, making the leader of the mercenaries perplexed. He wonders why he would be so confident when he's clearly outnumbered. The leader then orders his men to take care of their guests, and they all immediately charge at the eight-legged man. Unfortunately, that doesn't work out too well and he easily defeats the men using his signature skill, full-body hypermobility. The leader of the mercenaries is terrified when he sees how the eight-legged man's body twists and turns to take out his men. He yells for the insanely flexible killer to stay away from him, but the hitman just ignores him and finishes his assignment. Afterward, he returns to his hideout with the girl from earlier and is shocked to see that his men have been murdered. The cameras were destroyed and there's no evidence of a weapon anywhere. When he sees this, he concludes that the attacker could only have been one person, and that's none other than Peter. The eight-legged man wonders what kind of tricks the old man has used to stay alive, and even managed to kill his men in his condition. Either way, he's still intent on killing Peter before anyone else and before the bounty drops, so he sends the girl to report back to him when she finds Peter's whereabouts. The girl stays silent for a bit, thinking about the time back at the bookstore, where the kind old man had valiantly saved her from the ambush and genuinely seemed to care for her safety. But orders are absolute, so despite her hesitation, the girl accepts the task from her superior. After that, as they walk into the restaurant, the two and their subordinate find someone waiting for them inside. They see a young man sitting at one of the tables, and the eight-legged man assumes that he's a customer, telling him that they're closed for the day. He asks him what he came for, and if he made a prior reservation. Peter looks up at them and explains that he does not have a reservation. However, he comes here with a deep grudge. Hearing this, the eight-legged man asks him if he pressed him for his tab or something in the past, but our hero replies that he's somewhat correct, only that his tab is way too big. In fact, as we zoom in, our boy glares at the hitman while saying that his tab is about 7.6 billion won. When Peter says this to the eight-legged man, he smiles initially, thinking that it's just a joke. However, fear grips him as soon as he realizes what he's talking about, and he orders his men to lock the doors. He then proceeds to talk with the young man. He deduces that he's connected to Peter and assures him that he won't be leaving the restaurant alive. Even though he wants to kill him, the eight-legged man is curious to know who the young man is and how in the world he knows about Peter. He takes a closer look at him and confirms that he's not a member of their club. Even worse, he doesn't have any information on the mysterious man and has no idea what he's planning. As his subordinate cocks his gun, the eight-legged man wonders if the young man is Peter's secret child or his disciple. But he quickly dismisses the thought when he remembers that Peter has always worked alone. After failing to figure out who he is, he tells the young man that he's giving him a chance to live and offers him two options to choose. The first option is that he reveals Peter's whereabouts and walk out alive, while the second option is that he resists and die with a bullet to his head. Peter just taunts him by pretending to think, before claiming that he doesn't need any of his options. Naturally, that pisses off the octopus head, but our boy has a third option in mind to cool down that temper. With a smug and confident look on his face, he finally announces that his name is Peter. And heavens forbid, none of his targets have ever lived to tell the tale after hearing that name. The story continues, and after telling the eight-legged man that he's the legendary Peter they're looking for, our hero also reveals that he was the one who killed his subordinates. The eight-legged man is instantly dazed upon hearing this because it doesn't make any sense to him. The Peter he knows is an old man, so he asks the young man before him what he's talking about. Peter replies to him with a snide comment, suggesting that he's deaf. He then reiterates what he said, admitting that he killed the henchman he left at his hideout. The eight-legged man still isn't sure what's going on, and he doesn't believe that the man sitting in front of him is Peter. He mentally debates with himself about who the man really is and why he would attack them. Eventually he gets impatient and decides that things will have to get messy. He calls out to Peter, who he still thinks is a normal student, and threatens him. While the high school girl and the waiter pull out their weapons, the eight-legged man sternly demands that Peter reveal his true relation to the old man they're looking for. My guy watches as the girl pulls out her knife, ready for a fight and then replies to the eight-legged man. He tells him that there's one method he can use to find out the true relation, and when the eight-legged man asks what it is, Peter tells him that he would have to kill him. Hearing this, a wide smile appears on the octopus head's face. He tells Peter how convenient it would be for him, since killing is what he does best. He then gives his waiter the signal to shoot the assassin, but tells him to make sure he can breathe after getting shot. Just when the waiter pulls the trigger, a chopstick is sent flying into his neck, and he collapses to the floor with his neck impaled by it. Confused by what just happened, the eight-legged man and the girl turn to Peter and see him pulling out another chopstick. Miss Short Skirt, who was feeling very confident before, starts to doubt herself when she sees how lethal the strike was. Peter sent the chopstick right into the waiter's vitals, and after seeing that, she admits that she doesn't know anybody else who is that skilled, not even in the glory club. 
After that, our hero casually grabs two more chopsticks and continues his meal. The eight-legged man is impressed and compliments his flashy skill. As he walks over the waiter's body, admiring the assassin's handiwork, he asks what club the young man is from and offers him the chance to join the glory club. The eight-legged pretends to be friendly, but when he gets close enough, he swiftly pulls out his gun and unleashes a barrage of bullets on Peter. However, Peter is quick enough to use the table as a shield and hide behind it. The eight-legged man laughs as the bullets go through the table when he sees the red liquid flowing out from underneath it. He calls Peter a kid after all, for thinking he could stop the bullets from such close range with the table. Octopus head gloats, thinking that he's injured the young man severely, and offers him one last chance to reveal the ties he has to the old assassin. When he doesn't hear any response, he decides to finish the job properly, but when he looks behind the table, he's shocked to see that the red liquid is chili oil, and not blood. He turns around frantically and begins to panic when he doesn't see any sign of the skilled killer. He even starts to wonder if he's fighting some kind of ghost. Suddenly, he looks up and sees Peter hanging from a pillar. The assassin immediately jumps down and spits out the chili soup he'd been holding in his mouth on the octopus head's face. With his vision temporarily impaired, Peter proceeds to unleash an onslaught of punches on him. He starts with a swift punch to his arm when he tries to shoot him, and then follows up with a more powerful blow which destroys the gun. After disarming him, Peter lands another devastating smack to his face and finishes the lethal combination before the eight-legged man can process it all. At this point, he's bleeding from the mouth and wondering who this insanely fast kid is. To make things worse for him, he can't even see a thing. While the eight-legged man is still in a daze, Peter grabs his head with both hands and quickly twists it to snap his neck. After he deals the finishing blow, the eight-legged man's head is completely facing backward, and he falls to the ground again. As Peter walks away from him, the hitman just lies there in confusion he thinks about how he'd never seen such a skilled fighter at that age, in all his years of going up against countless opponents. He lies there reminiscing about when he was a young boy. He remembers a time during training when he was told that he would need a special technique he would use to subdue his distracted opponents. At that young age, the eight-legged man had already created a special technique that only he could use. He could pin his opponents to the ground like a mixed martial arts fighter and twist them up until they were begging for their lives. Despite this skill being incredibly lethal, his trainers only pushed him to go farther, claiming that he should make his grip so tight that it could kill the opponent. And with time, this is exactly what he did. He was squeezing the life out of his opponents. Even then, his trainer still had one more lesson for him, and it was that he should never turn his back on his opponent, even if he thinks the fight is over. After mastering the art of awareness in battle, the eight-legged completed his special technique, and was certain that he would never lose a fight against anyone. Unfortunately, here he is in the present, lying on the floor, knocked down by a young stranger. But I guess you only lose if you stay down, and the eight-legged man certainly isn't one to stay down. Before Peter can walk out of the place, the fallen hitman grabs his leg, and in the blink of an eye, he wraps himself around Peter using his signature move. He twists Peter's body till he finds it hard to breathe. He holds him in a chokehold, causing his head to turn purple due to the lack of blood and oxygen supply. He then tightens the grip, and tells Peter that he's been doing this work since he was born, pointing out that he's far more experienced than a newbie like him. If only he knew he was fighting with someone who spent 50 years in the organization. As the eight-legged man gloats about his superior skills and yells for Peter to die, someone calls out to him and brings him back to reality. He looks up, wondering who would be talking, and sees the young man he thought he was strangling, standing unharmed in front of him. Initially, he refuses to believe it. But then he looks back at the person he wrapped his body around and realizes that it's his subordinate who already got killed by a chopstick to the neck. Poor guy. Looking at the face, the eight-legged is stunned, and that's when he remembers that he didn't even notice who he was holding because he couldn't see properly. After the mind-numbing occurrence, he looks up at the young man standing above him in horror. He's been in this line of work for decades, and that's why he's 100% sure that he's going to die at the hands of the skilled killer. Seeing the scary look on Peter's face, the eight-legged man starts to think that he might even be better than the twelve apostles. Regardless, he's not just going to let him kill him like that, so he begs Peter to wait and hear him out. Peter agrees to talk with him, so he gets up to his feet and immediately grabs the high school assassin. He holds her face tightly and offers her to Peter, claiming that she could still be useful to him even though she doesn't have much field experience. The terrified girl, who's already sporting several bruises on her face, refuses to go, but her superior just shuns her and warns her not to interrupt his important negotiations. Surprisingly enough, Peter accepts the offer and comments on how quickly all Glory Club members make deals to save their skins. Seeing the young man agree to his offer, the octopus head quickly abandons the girl and makes his way to the exit. He tells Peter to use the girl as he wishes, and in return, he would pretend like nothing ever happened between them. In reality, it's clear that he's very eager to find out the young man's real identity. 
He even thinks about how he would harm him when he does. But before he can finish the thought, Peter interrupts him by saying a familiar word. Hearing him talk about the term, special technique, the eight-legged man stops in his tracks. He turns around, and Peter repeats a familiar phrase that the hitman's trainer always said to him. Back then, he told him that if he showed his back to his opponent, thinking he'd won, that would be the moment his head would fly off. The words trigger the old memories of his trainer, and it's at this moment that the eight-legged man starts to put the pieces together and sees the resemblance between Peter, his trainer, and the young man standing in front of him. Finally, he realizes that the young man is none other than the legendary Peter, and the very thought grips the octopus head with fear. Our hero then reminds him of what he said earlier, about how none of his opponents have lived to tell the tale after hearing his name. In the blink of an eye, Peter charges at him and uses a devastating skill to twist the hyper-flexible eight-legged man to the point that his bones snap and kill him on the spot. Later that night, we see another rather flexible character doing a handstand on the roof of a skyscraper. He has a tattoo of a woman on his back, and for some reason, it's upside down. His subordinate informs him that the eight-legged man is dead and reveals that they found no clues when they inspected the place, especially since the CCTV was removed. The calisthenics guy finds it amusing that an old man whose days were already numbered got shot, came back to life, and killed four of their men. He finally gets into a normal standing position, and tells his subordinate to inform the glory killers that the mission level has now been raised to triple S level, with a bounty of 7.6 billion won to go along with it. The insanely fit boss instructs his subordinate to notify all the glory killers that they're now allowed to openly hunt down the legendary Peter. The scene switches, and in the brightly lit busy streets of the town, we see a young boy calling his father's attention to the advertisement on one of the screens. Everyone else also turns to look at the latest update on the big screen, and among them is the man himself, Peter. It's a coded message from the Glory Club. A picture of the old Peter is on display, along with a message seeking help for the elderly and homeless. Under the ad is a phone number for the people to call if they'd like to donate, and as if that's not enough, people from the Glory Club are sharing flyers on the streets and seeking support. One of them approaches Peter and hands him a flyer, asking him to donate 20,000 one monthly to the Glory Club, posing as a non-profit organization. Our hero looks at the paper and is immediately outraged, squeezing it up and claiming that he'll go and take down the Glory Club by himself. After deciding that he'll bring down the organization, only one person comes to his mind to help him with his mission. Unfortunately, the person in question is most definitely a crazy weirdo, but our guy doesn't have any options. Later that night, Peter visits a demolished bathroom of all places. He enters the place and sees many people sleeping on the floor. As he navigates through the sea of clearly unhygienic people, he wonders how their numbers keep rising each time he visits. After passing through, he finally gets to the other side and goes to the wall to check out the posters there. He traces his hand across the wall, trying to remember the location of something, and recalls that it was between the posters for organ trafficking and a steamy night. He finally finds the spot he's been looking for and pushes the hidden button there to unveil a secret passage. He passes through the secret door and goes down the dark stairs till he reaches a beautifully furnished apartment. It's not his first time in this place, but he still shows a look of shock on his face at the sight of this amazing room. He looks around the place, drooling over the designer seats and expensive bottles of wine lined up on the shelves. It's hard for him to not admire this place, and he comments on how they've slathered it with money. But soon enough, our hero is brought back to reality when the pointy end of a cane is brought close to his neck. He looks over at the lady holding the cane, noticing that she's blind. He assumes that all the expensive things in the house are probably of no use to her, since she can't even see them. It seems her loyal dog doesn't like Peter very much, as it immediately starts barking at him with hostility. Hearing Peter's voice, a small smile appears on the blind woman's face, and she concludes that she'd soon have to get rid of a corpse for the first time in a while. Miss Rich and Blind uses her enhanced sense of smell to practically sniff out Peter's biometrics. She can immediately tell that he is young and that he's not one of the beggars around. For some weird reason, she can even tell that he exudes killing intent rather than a desire to rob her. Clearly, she isn't the average weak blind lady, and she proves it when she swings her cane at Peter, suspecting that he was sent by the Glory Club. She's even more accurate than most people with normal sight, but as you'd expect, Peter is just too quick for her so she keeps missing. She swings her cane again and again, but my man just dodges each attack with great skill and agility. It doesn't even look like he's putting any effort. By the time this wealthy Miss Matt Murdock is done swinging her cane, almost all the expensive furniture in the apartment has been damaged, but the target remains unscathed. She tells Peter that he is slippery like a rat, but he slips and hits his back on the wall. Hearing the thud, she locks her target and uses his mistake to her advantage, while telling him to be careful not to damage her expensive wallpaper. With great speed, she throws the cane at Peter like an Olympic javelin athlete, but once again, he dodges it gracefully. The cane enters the wall beside him, 
and Peter starts to wonder if the lady is really blind. After attempting to impale him, she lunges at him and prepares to land a devastating kick. She also taunts him for being confused that she's such a good fighter, even though she's blind. Unfortunately for her, Peter seems to have had enough, so he catches her midair and grabs her arm and leg before throwing her in anime style. The speed of the skill is so great that it sends her designer slippers and glasses flying. She might be blind, but the look in her eyes when she is slammed on the couch shows that she never expected such an insane power move. However, it looks like she also has some tricks up her sleeve. She pulls out a knife and holds it against Peter's face while he pins her to the couch. She admits that she's surprised someone of his caliber would still be a member of the glory club that now operates. She taunts him, suggesting that she didn't sense any killing intent, and points out how dirty he would feel if he murdered her when she's a disabled person. Even though his morals are probably against such acts, she tells him that he doesn't have a choice, since their work only ends when they kill a person. There's a brief pause and then she suddenly gives her dog, Alexander Macking, the go-ahead to attack Peter. Without skipping a beat, the blinged-out dog hurls itself at Peter, ready to sink all of its razor-sharp teeth into his body. However, something very unexpected happens when Peter suddenly tames the previously vicious dog. In fact, Macking is lying on its back and enjoying a nice belly rub while the blind lady is just lying there in utter confusion. A few moments later, we see an open bottle of Jack Annuals on the table, implying that all the hostilities are out of the way. Peter finally explains that he is no longer an old man, but he's back to the specially trained killer stud he used to be. The blind lady finds it difficult to wrap her head around the story, and even has to feel his face with her hands to confirm that he's not messing with her. It would only take a few more seconds for her to rip off his face if she keeps fondling it, so Peter tells her to stop. Still, she can't help herself and inspects for a little while longer. She is bamboozled by how soft his skin is, and how he no longer carries around the old man's smell she's more familiar with. Pretty sure my guy is quite happy about that. After feeling his face for 30 minutes, she still doesn't understand that what he's telling her can be possible. Suddenly, she falls back on the couch with a funny demonstration, asking if that's how he died. Macking playfully imitates her as she tells Peter to explain it, so she can try it out and be rejuvenated like him as well. When he doesn't respond, she gets back up and asks if the posture isn't the important factor. She keeps pestering him, suggesting that maybe the method he was attacked with is the determining factor. So, she continues her interrogation, asking if he was killed with a knife, gun, or even poison. With a desperate look on her face, she asks him to explain how she has to die to get rejuvenated like him. Suddenly, a weird boil appears on her forehead, implying that Peter smacked her, so she changes the topic and asks him if he has to go to the glory club by himself. When Peter affirms it, she asks him how he's planning to do that, and our hero replies that he's going to get inside using the eye of the storm. She still doesn't understand what he's talking about, so Peter explains that he plans to become a killer for the glory club because they're set on catching him, and that's the best way he can take down the organization from the inside. Hearing this, the blind lady opposes the idea, but soon realizes that it's actually a good plan. She points out how he has become younger, and that no one would be able to recognize him at all. He can infiltrate the organization undercover, and whatever plans they have to find him would already be in the palm of his hands. Impressed by his bold move, she pulls him by the tie and strangely starts to flirt with him. She finds him attractive because of how scary he has become. Rather than getting turned on or anything, my man just gets uncomfortable and tells her to let go of his tie because she's more scary at the moment. The flirtatious Miss Murdoch lets go of his tie and reveals that as brilliant as his plan sounds, it's still impossible to pull off. That's because in order to be a member of the Glory Club, he would have to be a graduate of the Glory Orphanage. Unfortunately for him, he's no longer going by Peter, so his old certificate is now invalid and showing that to anyone would be straight up suicide. She points out that the old Peter might be a graduate of the orphanage, but in his current form, he's nothing but an outsider. Even though it seems like there's no way to become a killer in the glory club, Peter tells her that she's wrong. In fact, he actually seems to know a solution. He's going to enroll as a student at the glory club's high school, and at this point, I'm not even sure what the fuck kind of organization this club is supposed to be. How do they have an orphanage, a school, and a killer syndicate at the same time? Anyway, it doesn't take long before Peter transfers into the school, and as you'd expect, all the girls are already drooling over his handsome face and toned body. From the gossip making the rounds, we find out that Peter's new alias isn't John Wick, but Kim Sungu. What a shame. The name works like an aphrodisiac on the infatuated schoolgirls, while his well-defined facial features make them swoon all over him. When it's time for them to head to the auditorium, even one of the teachers tries to make advances on him. Peter isn't the least bit interested in the stunners flocking around him, he's just focused on the mission he's come to accomplish at the school. He thinks about how the institution looks like your everyday high school on the outside, when in reality, its sole purpose is fostering killers. What in the actual fuck? 
There's even a killer intensive class, operated secretly where students are taught different ways to send a man to the afterlife. Even though it's a sick system, Peter, now going as Kim, decides that he's going to enter that class since it's the only route to become one of the glory club killers. All the while he thinks about his plan, he's surrounded by admirers from men, women, to even felines who can't seem to get enough of him. Eventually, Peter arrives at the auditorium for the girl's original ballet grand prize. He walks into the place, while his wealthy blind friend communicates with him through the comms he's wearing. She reminds him that only orphanage graduates are sent to killer class, and asks him if he has a way to get in. In response, Peter reveals that he has one way, an exception. It happens rarely, but you just have to get the attention of the management. And in order to do so, my man walks up to the podium and takes the mic. Macking and Miss Murdoch back home are both shocked at what he's about to do, but all they can do is listen. On the podium, Peter introduces himself as Kim Sungu, the new transfer student. The other students are confused because he's not supposed to be on stage, but our hero doesn't give a fuck. He continues, telling them about his love for violence and fighting. And as if that wasn't disturbing enough, Peter puts the icing on the cake and identifies himself as a killer in front of everyone. His statement leaves everyone horrified, including the two Mission Impossible spies back home. Elsewhere, we see a group of faceless people with glowing red eyes, listening to what Peter has just said. They match the description he just gave on stage perfectly, and the fact that they're all armed with deadly weapons makes it clear that they're going to be Peter's new classmates in no time. All the teachers and other students just stare at Peter in bewilderment as he continues his introductory speech. They're finding it difficult to fathom the idea that someone's dream is to become a killer. Under normal conditions, he should be expelled immediately for such a statement, but since he's already used to the system and knows what goes on underground, he's confident that his plan is going to work. Meanwhile, at home, Macking and Peter's blind friend are still in shock that he would attempt such a crazy stunt just to get the attention of the other killers. As everyone stands frozen in utter shock, Peter continues his speech, claiming that he forgot to tell them one last thing. He then leans closer to the mic, telling everyone that he's going to become a killer who's good at studying. And with a cocky expression on his face, he closes the speech by telling everyone listening to take care of him while he's at their school. One of the students watching Peter's speech on the smartphone finds it funny that he thinks he can become a studious killer. On the other hand, another student chimes in, suggesting that Peter's confidence is really cool. Just then, a fat dude shoves the girl with the phone out of the way, and in a matter of moments, Peter finds himself surrounded by the guy and some other students. He notices the menacing aura they're giving off, and quickly assumes that his plan has worked. He concludes that the students at the killer class have come for him, so he's delighted that he was able to lure them out. The big dude with a scar on his lips is the first to confront Peter. He addresses him as a killer and suddenly asks him if he seduced Yejin. As you'd expect, my man is confused since he has no idea what he's talking about. He asks Mr. Scarlips what he's on about, but rather than giving a reasonable response, the guy starts to tear up and curses at Peter. Still confused, Peter decides to just play along, thinking that the whole drama is probably a good setup for him to show his killer fighting skills. He hopes to gain the attention of the killer class by all means, even though he's already created a very crazy first impression. The big dude looking for a fight is actually Jang Yasul. For a very long time, he's been in love with only one girl, and I'm pretty sure you can guess who she is. Yep, it's Yejin. They've been in a very blissful and romantic relationship for a lengthy 22 days. And don't judge him, that's actually enough time to fall helplessly in love. Jang loves Yejin a lot, and has even been crowned Divine Honor High School's best lover for his public display of affection toward his stunning boo. Unfortunately for him, the love of his life got stolen from him that morning by a guy named Peter. Yejin was absolutely lovestruck when she laid eyes on this mysterious person, and so, Jang came to take revenge. Without further hesitation or provocation, Scar Lips charges at Peter with clenched fists, attempting to land a killer blow on him. But of course, Peter is too fast for him. He swiftly dodges the hit, before preparing to land a lethal right hook on Jang's face. Jang happens to be quite popular around here because he was able to conquer the whole of Mapo district with his fist. He's clearly a tough guy, and from his towering height, you can tell he's not one to be messed with. However, for the first time in Jang's life, he actually senses death when he sees Peter's fist racing toward his face. As the punch is about to land, Jang closes his eyes and mentally apologizes to Yejin for not being able to protect her. Peter sees his fear and decides not to land the powerful blow on him, and stops his hand to instead flick Jang on the forehead. Granted, his flick also does some damage, but it's a lot better than what he initially intended. Jang falls to the ground, whimpering with his swollen forehead while Peter just stands over him. Out of the blue, a teacher calls out to Peter and runs toward the scene. With a red card in hand, he scolds our hero for fighting. He grabs him by the cheek like an angry mother and asks him what his father does for a living. At which, Peter just replies that his father is dead, which makes the teacher feel sorry and apologetic. 
Regardless, he doesn't let go of that cheek and pulls Peter away, telling him to follow him as he keeps scolding him for fighting in their sacred school. Jang gets back up and yells at Peter, telling him to let go. It seems his brain hasn't left the fight yet, so another student points out that no one is holding him. Elsewhere, we see the real killer students whose faces still aren't revealed, and they're deliberating on what to do about Peter after his little stunt. One of them suggests that they wait a little longer and find out more about him, while the other agrees with him since he finds the whole thing fun. However, another one just suggests that they kill him to end this mess. Meanwhile at the auditorium, Peter is still being dragged away by the cheek. The teacher tells him to follow him, and our hero points out that he is already following him. As he's dragged away, some other students just watch and gossip. Some of them find the new transfer student crazy, while others think that he's in his emo phase, which they think is cool. Just then, we see Miss Short Skirt from before, the girl who tried to kill Peter at the bookstore. She sees him being dragged away, and is immediately horrified because she thinks that he's transferred into the school to destroy it from the inside. At lunchtime, we finally get to know that her name is Yunbil, when our hero goes to sit beside her. Not surprisingly, she doesn't want him around her since she can more or less guess his plans, so she gets uncomfortable and asks him why he came here. Peter explains that people kept following him around, and that's why he fled. Afterward, he asks her why she is sitting there. She reluctantly tells him that it's because she didn't have an appetite. Unfortunately for her, my man isn't buying that story, because he notices the mountain of food stacked up on her tray. He points out that the food is quite much, but the girl just turns away from him, calling him noisy. Suddenly, she starts thinking back to the night the eight-legged man offered her to Peter as a sacrifice. She remembers how he asked her to tell the organization that the old Peter killed the people there. He told her that she would have to do it if she wanted to live, and made it clear to her that her lie would become her lifeline. The girl reminds our guy that she did as he requested and kept her promise. Afraid of the assassin, she asks him why he's come looking for her after she did her part, but Peter explains that he didn't come particularly to find her. With a mouthful of strawberries and a skeptical look on her face, she asks him if he's come to kill her now. Peter reiterates that he hasn't come looking for her, but that doesn't change the fact that she's very angry at him. Because of him, the organization has been monitoring her every move, so she starts lamenting to Peter. Hearing her complain, he surmises that she's not the kind of person that words easily get to. Yunbil keeps complaining, so our hero tells her that she should put up with whatever she's going through. He reminds her that the only reason she's even alive and stuffing herself with food at the moment is because he was kind enough to save her life. Despite how upset she is, the girl doesn't stop eating. She snaps at Peter, claiming that he didn't save her and that she survived on her own. Seeing the rage in her eyes, the handsome assassin finally lets go of the topic and accepts her claim. However, she doesn't stop there and continues to lambast him, telling him that he doesn't know anything about the organization. Yunbil tells Peter that she has no idea how scary the place is, and on top of that, she claims that he doesn't even know who she is. Her rant goes on, and she tells him that he's just an outsider, claiming that he won't be able to do anything that affects the organization. Even while she was ranting, Yunbil somehow managed to finish the pile of food that was on her tray, and while Peter is still moping, she gets up and starts to walk away. Before she can leave though, our boy tells her that she can help him shake up the organization, but she doesn't see any reason why she should. To convince her, Peter tells her that they're on the same boat because they both don't know anything, and says that he's counting on her. He calls her Yunbil at first, but then changes his mind and addresses her as Lee Yuna. Hearing this, the girl stops in her tracks and turns around, shocked that he knows her real name. I guess now she knows that our boy knows more than she thinks. However, when she turned around to look at him and probably ask him how he knew, Peter was already gone. The scene shifts, and we see the students of Divine Honor High School, getting pumped up for the athletic competition. We see a student named Jonathan running a sprint race, and he's popularly regarded as the Usain Bolt of the school. He's also the current 400-meter sprint record holder. But now, there's a new sprinter in town who's not only going to smash his record, but also end his career. As Jonathan runs with all his might, Peter casually and effortlessly breezes past him. After the race, our hero receives cheers from adoring fangirls, while a sobbing Jonathan is being comforted by Jang on the sidelines. All the while, one of the killer students watches everything from the bushes. Later, we see Peter acing an eye test. Other students find it impossible to see the tiny numbers on the wall, but he just gets all of them correct while casually covering one eye. The other students are amazed that he can see everything on the board, and while he unintentionally shows off his eagle eyesight, someone keeps observing from the shadows once again. In culinary class, the students are taught how to cut fruits extravagantly. The teachers and another student assume that he probably doesn't know how to handle a knife, so they tell him to be careful. Peter just tells them that he'll do his best, and the teacher offers to help him if he finds it difficult. He proceeds to flex his skill by sculpting a rabbit from a fruit, and it's so hecking cool that some people think that the rabbit is alive. 
Elsewhere, we see a group of students threatening the teacher who scolded Peter earlier. The man asks the students what their parents do for a living, and instead of answering, the mob accuses him of mocking their parents. The ringleader then punches the teacher to the floor when he tries to exercise his authority. The rascals even go further and threaten to sue him and get his license suspended if he dares to try and punish them with penalty points. They warn him to sit there and not mess with them before deciding to upload the recording of the teacher on TikTok. Just then, they see Peter heading their way. He asks them if they hit the teacher, but the students just tease him because he talks like an old man. The assassin challenges the ringleader, who tells him to leave and spits on his shirt. Peter just glares at him, so the guy gets upset and warns him to leave if he doesn't want to get killed. He then takes a swing at Peter, but of course, it's dodged as usual. He tries over and over, but keeps missing because his target is too nimble. The spectacle turns hilariously ridiculous, and even his minions start laughing at him. Peter then sweeps the guy's feet off the floor. Another one tries to hit him with a brick from behind, but he punches it to bits as well. Seeing his might, the now terrified rascals apologize to the teacher, before running away with their tails between their legs. While leaving, they call Peter a villain, claiming that justice always prevails. After they leave, Peter checks on the teacher, but the man is more interested in lecturing him not to fight. Our hero notices that the rascals left their phone, and when he tries to pick it up, the previously frail teacher gets up and tries to surprise him with a kick. Peter blocks it of course, and the teacher's suspicions are confirmed. He points out that Peter didn't spill his drink during the fight, and asks him why he learned how to fight like a professional. Realizing that the man has been pretending to be weak all along, the young assassin deduces that he's one of the glory killers. And without wasting any time, he reveals that he learned how to fight that way so he can have his revenge on them for stealing his life. The teacher asks Peter if he would like to join their volunteering club, and he immediately deciphers the coded message. He admits that he's been waiting for the teacher to come forward and approach him about it, and as it turns out, the faceless guy watching him all day was none other than the teacher. Peter agrees to join the volunteering club, and the teacher takes him to the secret class where the various glory club killers are fostered. The moment Peter opens the door, he's surprised to see a very normal-looking classroom. The students inside look so average, and some even look like nerds. The teacher says that this is the place where they raise killers, but our boy is just disappointed by everything he's looking at. The teacher then takes the podium and introduces Peter to the rest of the class, telling them that he's a new volunteer who will be working with them going forward. When Lee Yuna sees him, she's visibly horrified that he has already made it here. She wonders why he came, and when she catches him looking at her, she prays in her mind that he doesn't say anything to her that would blow her cover. Thankfully, he just gives her an awkward wink. I guess the old man in him is still very much active. But unfortunately, Yuna finds the wink more scary than awkward, because she's afraid that it means he's going to kill her. Peter looks back at the rest of the class and introduces himself properly, thanking them for the warm welcome. He says this with a gentle smile, but in his mind, he thinks about what an ordinary place it is to raise future killers. The thought is interrupted by two students, who appear to be the bullies of the class. They don't seem to like Peter very much, and make it clear that they don't care what his name is. Our hero just takes a closer look at the guys, and is relieved that they look fit, unlike the rest of the class. The more talkative guy among the two, with weirdly cut ears, is named Doc Gohyun. He's from the organization's orphanage, and his special trait is speed. He tells Peter that only people from the orphanage are allowed into the class, and points out how it makes no sense to allow him inside. The bigger guy between them, Jay, finishes his brother's statement. He's a 58-generation graduate of the orphanage, and his special traits are ultra-strength and grappling. Peter just stares at the clueless boys, and fights the urge to reveal that he's also from the Glory Orphanage, and is even a first-generation graduate. Seeing the tension rising, the teacher interrupts, suggesting that the class should just have a simple welcoming party. Hearing this, the other students suggest that they should have punched to go along with it. Initially, they appear to be harmless and vibrant students who want to have a nice party, but the aura quickly changes into something much darker. Their true killer nature is finally on display, when they reveal that they are talking about blood punch and with sinister looks on their faces, they all take out their weapons. The Dako brothers also express their interest in being involved in the bloody welcome ceremony. Liyuna tries to stop them, knowing how dangerous Peter is. Unfortunately, they push her aside, and warn her to stay out of the way if she doesn't want to get beat up along with the newcomer. Seeing how stubborn they are, the girl gives up on trying to stop them. The brothers confront Peter, addressing him as the new kid. They ask him if he can fight, and if he's some sort of a neighborhood hooligan but our hero just modestly tells them that he can fight a bit. He has fought over 1,500 brutal battles, but the students don't need to know that. And after hearing his modest answer, the brothers who finish each other's sentences tell him that he should be nervous because the fight is going to be his last. They charge at him simultaneously, Hyun with a dagger and Jay with his fist. Not surprisingly, Peter easily blocks their attacks, but they keep pushing him back. 
during the fight. Hyun tells him that the volunteer club is no place for a neighborhood hooligan, and claims that Peter has no idea why they risk their lives to become the best killers in the world, just like their idol. Our hero is confused to hear this, so he asks who they're talking about. And of course, Hyun reveals that he's talking about the legendary Peter. As they fight in front of the giant painting of the man himself, my guy wears a bored expression on his face. He holds the brothers off as they attempt to overpower him, both with words and physical strength. They tell him that there's no place for him here, so Peter finally breaks free from their grip. He admits that listening to their split-up dialogues is tiring, and tells them to just come at him together. Sure enough, they charge at him, but not before telling him that he's out of his mind. Just like the first time, they launch themselves at their opponent, claiming that he has no idea how much weight their 18 years of living possess. As they call him a nepotism baby one more time, Peter braces for their combined force while reminding himself that he's lived for 65 years. The next thing we see is the Dako brothers sweating and panting with wide grins. Hyan boasts that he didn't even use up to half of his strength, while the teacher commends them and claims that they should have gone easier on Peter. Even the other students are cheering the brothers on, claiming that Peter was so terrified at them that he left. Wait a minute, why would Peter leave? In the dimly lit hallway, we see him walking away from the volunteer club. Lee Yuna confronts him, asking him why he's underestimating the club. Peter claims not to understand what she's talking about, but the girl replies that she's smart enough to see the truth. She explains that she was watching his fight with the Doc Go brothers earlier, and accuses him of not putting any strength into his fists at any point. Peter pretends to be confused, and claims that he always does his best during fights. Unfortunately for him, the sharp girl isn't buying any of that crap. She accuses him of lying, and reveals that she can prove it too. Lee Yuna points out that unlike the Doko brothers who were sweating profusely and gasping for air after the fight, he didn't even break a sweat. Peter just stares into space with a bored look on his face, refusing to say a word, which makes the girl get fed up as she pins him to the wall. Just like some high school lovers in your favorite movies, she closes the gap between them. Yuna looks the man in the eyes and demands to know the reason he didn't put any effort into the fight, pointing out how suspicious his presence in the school already is. But despite all her attempts to make him fess up, he just stares back at her with a blank expression. She asks him what he stands to gain by hiding his power, and with their faces inches away from each other, she demands to know what he's scheming. Peter finally replies, asking if she really wants to know. The girl affirms, and the two stand there in awkward silence for a while as she awaits his answer. However, Peter just slips under her arm and escapes, telling her he will reveal it to her at lunchtime the following day. As she watches him leave, the girl can do nothing but stand there in frustration. Later that night, we see the bus driver feeling excited that he got paid a whopping 1 million won just for renting the bus. As he skips away, thinking about how lucky he was, a man in glasses calls out to him. The driver expected a lot of passengers, but the man reveals that it's just him that would be going. Moreover, the dude seems to carry a ridiculous number of suitcases with him as well. Either way, the driver offers to help him load them up, not feeling so lucky anymore when he thinks about how many suitcases he would have to carry. He's interrupted, however, when the man in glasses creepily asks him if he would like to bet on something. In a very ominous manner, he tells the driver to try and guess what's inside the suitcases. The scene shifts, and we see that the two have started their journey. The driver is understandably frightened by the man in glasses, who clearly looks dangerous as fuck. The driver thinks about how he didn't accept the bet, but is very certain that he saw one of the suitcases moving. The next day at school, the Glory Killer's instructor briefs the students on a new quest. He informs them about the client, Choi Yucheng, who is the DIA Group's chairman and one of Glory Club's biggest sponsors. He tells them that the team that succeeds on the quest will be rewarded with a volunteer certificate, along with the chairman's recommendation. In other words, the winners will officially become Glory Killers. The instructor then proceeds to reveal what the quest is all about. He tells them that it involved recapturing. There have been some recent kidnappings of teenagers, but one of them happens to be the chairman's only son. One of the students points out that they can easily leave the rescue mission to the cops, but the teacher explains that the chairman wants revenge. After breaking it down to them and explaining that the mission is simply to save his son, the instructor asks them to indicate interest by a show of hands. However, none of the students are interested in the rescue mission. The instructor is shocked to see them all standing with their hands behind their backs, so he reminds them that they will have to spend two more years to become official killers if they refuse the offer. He urges them to grab the opportunity to quickly acquire their certificates, but the students remain unfazed. Some of them even start pointing out that the task should have been handed to adults and not to them. But just then, the Dako brothers interrupt, claiming that they're the only ones capable of accomplishing the task. The brothers quickly notice that they're not the only interested parties, because Peter and Lee Yuna have their hands up as well. Peter tells the girl to stop copying him, but she claims that her hand has been up since before. Like the killer that he is, he threatens to cut her hand if she's lying 
but the girl urges him to stop the nonsense. The Daco brothers are pumped up for the mission and ask the teacher if they can just go in and beat up a bunch of people. The instructor tells them that it is not the case and informs them that they need to follow certain conditions. Hearing this, Peter gets excited, knowing that he's finally gotten his chance to become an official killer in the organization. Unfortunately, he's disappointed as the scene shifts, because him and the other contestants would first of all have to play as much as they want, since they're recovering the hostage at an amusement park of all places. What's going to happen in this park? Will the regressed assassin go on a date with Yuna to kill the time? Or is it gonna end up as one big mess with a shitload of killing? Stay tuned to find out in the next episode. Until next time.